Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me uh, um, on this uh, lovely morning here in Portland uh, for another uh, webinar in the Silla webinar series. Uh, my name is Shamir Karko. Uh, if you guys don't know me, know me by now, you really should go watch one of the earlier webinars or, or look us up on the website. I'm not going to tell you who I am uh, because I'm really excited uh, to welcome uh, Marcus. Um, and uh, and he'll tell you about himself in a minute. But before we go there, uh, I want to tell you the story of how I met Marcus. Um, it was quite literally at my best friend's wedding, uh, which he was officiating. And um, and that same best friend had uh, a kid last week, which is uh, an exciting development. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I started, I've been talking to Marcus and learning more about uh, the ICO world, the crypto world actually, and, and all the kind of the different things that are happening in it. And uh, he helped me a lot, I would say a year, 18 months ago, with just understanding like everything that's happening in the space. Uh, and that's really what I want to help you guys uh, understand as well, is sort of, you know, uh, everything you need to know about uh, ICOs or, or even just about issuing tokens and token economics. Uh, Eager to get into that, but before we do, Marcus, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and then the story of Marcus? Well, uh, thank you, Shamir. And uh, as a side note, if uh, an old friend of yours ever hits you up and asks you to officiate a wedding and you don't find yourself in possession of the proper licensure, I highly recommend uh, the Church of the Subgenius. It's a um, pretty quick five or 10 day turnaround. Um, one can become a minister more easily than you might think. Uh, these Good days. to know. Good to know. So the story of Marcus, we, I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I've become old enough that we don't really have the time. But the, the, <laughs> I know that feeling. The, <laughs> the, uh, the high points and low points. Um, I, I really like. I guess the, the one liners that I'm a high school dropout from Alabama. Uh, I have. Um, acquired most of my professional experience through uh, just kind of hitting the books and trying to figure things out my own way along uh, along the way. Um, I was, I've was i been in software um, for, for most of my professional career. Um, and uh, specifically, I started, started uh, Chroma in 2013, um, oh, which wow. I know it's ancient in, in the crypto space. Um, the, the notable thing about uh, Chroma is that we um, we, we, we were kind of bad at doing things much too early, uh, but, but notably in, uh, in 2015, we uh, seeing the structure of crypto assets and how they can be tied to potential investments. We saw that there'd be some regulatory challenges ahead, and we were, um, we were I, I believe, first uh, globally to find um, a regulatory path for doing a, a regulated ICO. And that came out of uh, out of Portland, Oregon, in, in late 2015. We worked with the state of Oregon to, uh, to get clearance for it. And then since then, we uh, we essentially have been we're we're a small boutique shop, um, and we essentially are kind of the picks and shovels uh, aspect of the ICO industry. We don't on, only focus on crypto; we also like other kinds of alternative assets. So we help people raise money, and we also build prototype uh, crypto technologies for other firms. That's that's uh, that's pretty cool. So one thing that might be really um, helpful is to sort of just understand the history of ICOs themselves. Yes. Um, and, um, and, and even, of course, like, I think everybody's aware that securities issuance has been happening for centuries. And there's, you know, there's the SEC, and pretty much every country in the world has some regulatory equivalent of that, which controls things like IPOs and trading of stocks and bonds. Uh, but it feels like the ICO phenomenon uh, has really just taken off in the last five, six years, maybe even less than that. So how did that all end up coming uh, together? And I'm, as you were clearly involved in it from almost the start. Uh, well, uh, yeah, it, it did certainly, it predated us by a bit. Uh, so, so yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, it, 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 so breaking the semantics down a bit, it's widely considered that the first uh, ICO was the Ethereum offering, which, uh, I need to check my notes here. I believe that was 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, so here offering is kind of a consideration because, uh, of course, the first um, modern cryptocurrency was Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin uh, wasn't considered itself an ICO using this nomenclature because uh, 
famously, um, if you were willing to uh, be in touch with the original Satoshi, there were Bitcoin faucets. You could you could run a miner on it on a consumer P, uh, CPU. Uh, you know, there's all these stories. Of course, if you ran that miner in the first uh, you know the first year of that project, you could easily net what today would be millions of dollars uh, while running out for, for pizza. Uh, but the, the, the Bitcoin project never um, themselves spun up the mechanism to, to purchase Bitcoin, you know, in order to fund uh, Bitcoin as a project. They simply released it into the world. And, um, you know, they, they, they sort of supply and demand around Bitcoin. It sort of worked out well, given that the demand for Bitcoin was was low enough during that time that they found themselves properly decentralized before all the sort of money interests came into play. Now, with Ethereum, uh, Vitalik, the Buterin, the, uh, the sort of thought leader behind the project and the core developer, um, they found themselves in a bit of a pickle because they had a big ambition. They were inspired by Bitcoin, but they didn't have the resources on hand to properly build and launch the mainnet network. So they found themselves in need of a funding mechanism. So Ethereum pioneered the model that we're all still kind of using today, which is that they you know, pre-sold uh, allotments of, of Ether. And so before Ether was available on a main net, you were able to, uh, to invest in it uh, with Bitcoin. So, so the, the uh, Ethereum had, well, at the time it was a very successful ICO. Uh, what's funny is that the entire Ethereum ICO, given that they're now the between the number two and number three most most valuable coins on the on the network, uh, the ICO netted them. I mean, it was in the double digit millions. So I mean, it was a wild success story. Um, I believe uh, you know Vitalik himself was still a teenager at the time. Of course, the multiple. Uh, if if you ha if there's anyone in the audience that happens to be phoning in from their luxury yacht that participated in that, the multiples of the initial investors in Ethereum. Um, it, it, was, it was a very wild return on investment, and it did a lot to kick off the ensuing mania. Uh, so the model that was used there um, has, uh, has, has been improved in a lot of ways, um, and of course, uh, a lot of the ways to discuss the, the, the way the history developed from there is that as it became a more uh, broadly participated in phenomenon, we had to start thinking about this is actually an investment. And so the history to date has, has a lot to do technical improvement of the process, the kind of breadth of projects that are being financed, and of course, what the uh, national governments of the world think about all this funding activity. Yeah, and, and, and it feels as if that original uh, issuance uh, of the of Ethereum, where you know, people uh, put in their Bitcoin in exchange for an allotment of Ether, and then when the Ether main that went, went live, they got the, uh, the Ethereum main, main net went live, they got Ether in exchange for those uh, Bitcoin allotments. Um, and then now it's the Ethereum is the kind of the premier platform for doing ICOs and has right. been for the last, at least the last three years. That's right. Um, and uh, that's why everybody else uh, does ICOs. And it, I, don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think there were like over a thousand ICOs uh, by this point, uh, right. and there was this this massive boom uh, through uh, sixteen, but really it was really like twenty seventeen and the right. second half of twenty seventeen and the first quarter of eighteen That's right. uh, that you had the big boom, and as frequently happens in almost any financial asset market, when you have a big boom, you have a bust off. Right. Yes. That's uh, right. And so now it feel, we're it feels like we are living. Not just in Portland's winter, but in the crypto winter. Yeah, that's right. Uh, since kind of spring of last year, that's right. when the Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin and Ether prices just kept going down, and the effect right now feels like almost nobody's doing any ICOs anymore. Um, so the, the is that what you're seeing as well? Uh, complete kind of shrinkage of the in, uh, the issuance, and what is that doing to the ecosystem as well? Yeah, great question. So yeah, the um... This term "crypto winter" is, is kind of solidified, um, and, and yeah, um, <laughs> it, yeah, you can you can measure it really it, it, with pure price action to begin with. Um, I mean, looking at Ethereum, which you're right, it's it's the most common platform uh, from which at least a lot of other coins have used to conduct their, if not their offerings, but sometimes their the actual networks themselves are running on Ethereum. So the price of Ethereum uh, has retraced. Uh, I mean, I, I think that I think the, the the widest retracement was something close to ninety percent. So it was really quite a quite a swift hollowing out of, of value. And, and so that, that price retracement um, had a direct effect in reducing demand uh, for new issuances. That coupled with raising the, the, the bar for uh, 
conducting an issuance has been raised, the cost to, to conduct an offering, because now the uh, net compliance with securities law, basically, it's much more expensive. You can't just roll the coin out the door. You've got to hire lawyers and get a PPM together, et cetera. Uh, it, so there certainly are uh, ICOs, contemporary ICOs. You can you can look at the aggregator sites and see that they're, you know, perhaps, I mean, I, I, depending on how you measure them up, I think there's probably at least a dozen, uh, you know, using a very low bar for, for credulity, probably a dozen decent ICOs out there right now, right as we speak. Uh, but that number's down. I, I mean, I think it's probably, uh, the, in terms of numbers of issuance, it's probably down by a tenth. You know, it's probably related to prices, uh, strangely. Yeah. And then, of course, the um, the quality bar, I think, has been changed as well. Uh, the, the kind of in, one thing that you're not seeing is the massively ambitious sums that were being sought during the height of the, the boom. Uh, famously, Filecoin uh, raised some 320 million uh, in 20, that was 2017. Uh, Telegram raised uh, like some billions. That's right. That's right. They crossed the billion dollar threshold, yeah. uh, which is which fascinating. Uh, I mean, of course, it's, it's, it's natural to want to roll your eyes a bit to think, wow, so pre-product launch, a company that is ra raising the equivalent of a crowd sale north of a billion dollars. It, 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 you can just smell the mania on it. But, you know, it's also interesting to note that uh, traditionally to put together a billion dollars required all the collusion of investment banks yeah. uh, and Wall Street. And so th this is, again, the mania at least showed that there is a theoretical a demand uh, amongst a broader set of the population to, to invest um, in these early stage crypto companies. Um, so we're, we're far from that height now, but um, we all know that, that uh, those kinds of things are possible, perhaps possible again. Completely. And you know, this isn't something that's, that's sort of unusual, right? Like if you look at, forget ICOs, you look at the NASDAQ or NYSE, right. there was a huge IPO boom in the late 90s, it was called the dot-com boom. That's right. And then there was a bust. and. Uh, NYSE and especially NASDAQ prices crashed and between um, sort of spring of 2000 and uh, 2003 2004 there were almost no uh, IPOs like uh, and then the investment bankers have this term which is the, the IPO window uh, and you know they talk about the IPO window being open not being closed um, it's not like the, the, the NYSE is shut down uh, it's just that the traditional IPO process involves getting a bunch of investment banks to underwrite the offering, as, it, as it's called, and actually go out and sell it to all their clients. And when prices are going down or there's other problems in the market, you just can't do that. Uh, so you get the, the, it just feels like the, the crypto asset world is beginning to act more like the traditional world where when there's massive dislocations or, the, or price drops, New ICOs or just like new IPOs are much harder to do. Um, that, then when the, when the market is booming, you know you can sell lots and lots of things. Um, and so analogous to that, it also fe feels like definitely for at least the, the the first like you know the Ethereum quote unquote ICO. Um, but uh, for a lot of those early ICOs, um, they basically acted, and I'm sure they felt, and maybe they even had legal opinions. I don't know. To the effect that they didn't need to uh, abide by any regulations, and they didn't—they mm -hmm. weren't regulated, That's right? right? That's right. Um, and the, and you could on a platform like Ethereum, and, and you still can uh, technically uh, just you know create your smart contract, put all the, the the kind of the mechanics of the ICO issuance into a token uh, right. or into uh, into a piece of code that's a smart contract, launch it on the mainnet, and then it will operate the way it's programmed to operate. Um, so you could technically do it. Uh, the, the the hard part of like traditional IPOs is like you couldn't uh, you you couldn't just go into the NYSE systems and start issuing stock. That's right. <laughs> and there, there were a lot of uh, sort of gatekeepers before that was possible. You can still go into Ethereum, just download the uh, a node, run it. Uh, once it syncs up, you can write your own software. Really, it's very hard for anybody to stop you from uh, from doing an ICO. Um, but the legal implications of that it feels like people now understand that even if it's technically doable, it might not be legally doable in a lot of countries. So walk us through the evolution of how uh, ICOs, kind of the, maybe the standard ICO mechanism has changed given that people now understand that yes, these things are regulated and there are things that you have to do in the US and in other countries. Absolutely, yeah. So um, 
and this is this is really for it sounds like such a dry topic when you're when you're even a few steps outside of it in terms of uh, you know um, it does financial <laughs> securities I regulation I do it actually is you know it's, it's incredibly fascinating because you, you make you make a great point which is to say you know as a thought experiment uh, what if what if the Nasdaq had a self serve kiosk for issuers right <laughs> what would happen to society if you could kind of walk up you know and just sort of list something uh, and 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 so you're, you're you're also right to say that the technology offered. In, in, for instance, by Ethereum, although you could certainly uh, roll it up and using other technologies as well, um, there is the equivalent of uh, boilerplate code. Um, you know, a, a, a few uh, moderately experienced developers could could technically uh, prepare the offering itself um, in in an, in an afternoon. So the I, I think, barrier, there, is, I think yeah. there is a medium post of how to do uh, how to do an ICO in an afternoon or something to that. Yeah, I, I mean, remember reading, <laughs> and I, there might be more than one. Uh, but it is possible to, if you know basics of programming, to write a smart contract and push it on the main net every day. Yeah, I mean even less. I mean yeah. so yeah, theme forest uh, website with a countdown mm -hmm. uh, in the ERC twenty uh, contract template open Zeppelin. Um, the, the pre yeah. initially here, here's the, this is this is and we'll get to to, to the to your real question where does the regulation come in but part of it was that the number of issuances at the beginning was constrained by in a sense the the wizardry available from from the talent market how many people knew enough to launch a, a cryptocurrency it seems like an innately more complex technology than say a SaaS application you're dealing with more novel concepts so it seemed to be at first, that if there was simply an actual feasible technical offering, that the market itself had said, "Well, here's one, here's another one that's been made possible." Yeah. But Ethereum actually kind of commoditized that process, yeah. so you didn't necessarily have to write your own proof of work algorithm or your own mining node. You know, you could actually yeah. just say, "Well, this is actually just a smart contract, right?" So, as 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 demand increased, because you saw these wild returns, and then of course the the, the mechanism of the offering commoditized the process. You, you got this sort of ramping up of, of, of course, issuances just just increasing uh, as more and more money is being poured in. And, and with that swerving of capital and, and, and more rapid issuance, and of course, uh, more and more and more risk is leaking into the system, I mean, wildly. Um, that that absolutely drew the attention of regulators around the world. But of course, in the, in the entire uh, globe, perhaps one of the more ferocious and aggressive uh, Financial regulator is, of course, in the United States is SEC because, of course, they're looking after a lot of capital. So the history of how this space began to sort of go more in lines with traditional capital markets, I, I, I would point to actually I would point to Filecoin's offering, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, so so briefly, uh, Filecoin is um, uh, it's, it's it's a great project, with great technical underpinnings. It's basically distributed storage. So if you can think about uh, Amazon's S3. Uh, it's it's the distributed version of that, uh, yeah. simply stated. So um, great technical team. Now they knew that they needed a huge amount of capital. It's a, it's a really ambitious project, um, much more than a smart contract. It's a whole sort of layer one, as they say, solution. Need a lot of capital to build it. So they decided to seek again a few hundred million dollars. Uh, they had amongst the first of the attorneys that they hired. Uh, finally, talked some sense in them and said, "Hey, listen. With any given issuance, a lot of interpretation here." At the time, there was a lot of um, very immature uh, legal reasoning. Uh, a lot of a lot of ICOs that were not seeking any form of, of exemption from securities law, they had this kind of back of the napkin. There were these checklists going around to say, well, if you're distributed, if you're decentralized, then you're not really an investment because of these reasons. Um, as, as these companies sought more established global law firms, say, what is your opinion on whether we're going to be sued out of this 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 capital if we raise it? They eventually convinced them to say, "Look, we really should just be safe here. The, the SEC is not at, at in the time of, of again. We're talking twenty. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I think this is 2017, probably. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so right, of 2017, right. So yeah. in the height of the mania, uh, given the sum raise and 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 the, set, the soundness of the team, they decided to take to make the sacrifice of saying, you know what, let's find an actual regulated path to doing this in the U.S. That was the debut of a set of legal documents that we refer to as the SAFT, which is the Simple Agreement for Future Tokens. So Filecoin did a SAFT? That's right. Uh, they, they essentially financed the creation of the SAFT. Uh, a number of law firms, it was, a, it was a kind of a witch's brew. Cooley was a firm that has gotten a lot of attention for the release of the SAFT. Uh, behind the scenes, a lot of other firms were collaborating on that. 
And basically they said, look, here's the deal. We should presume here, <coughs> especially because the network, it's not live. So that your arguments about the decentralized sort of nature of this potentially evading classification, well, not today. As of today, you're, you're forking over cash. And again, they, they didn't do a Bitcoin swap, primarily US dollars. That's interesting. Uh, and, and secondly, you know, you're going to have to simply wait and hope that we launch this network and that it's successful. So, it, 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 you know, frankly, of course, that is the definition of security. That's what happened. Um, uh, but again, that, that is how the Ethereum one worked as well, except that they did launch their network and they used Bitcoin instead of cash. Absolutely. And so the, the distinction between between the two, it's just really interesting to break down. So, so again, with Filecoin, you, you, they, they said, because this is an investment and we have this legal document that explains, you know, essentially they, they modeled after the Y Combinator safe, right? Oh, so yes. it's similar to a, the safe mechanism. Uh, give me some cash today. I'm going to promise you later when we're live, you'll get your token. So by shifting that exchange of value over time, you, you basically faced uh, yourself with the, accredited, the, the dreaded accredited investor questionnaire. And, yes. and, and they were the first big project to say, we're going to legally accept this using this model, but you really have to be. And, that and, and, and there, the, 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 a huge shift took place yeah. because if you, made a, if you made a pie chart of the sources of capital, um, I, I would believe that the, the Ethereum, and it's hard to say this actually, because this is, you can do some on-chain analysis. The, the, the theory being that a lot of the early ICOs were being driven by what we consider retail or individual investors. And, and you kind of want that in a, in a decentralized network, a larger number of people invest in smaller amounts. Um, with, with Filecoin, it, it sort of signaled the, the introduction of larger sources of high net worth capital. Uh, you also saw more hedge funds or family offices and some institutional capital, uh, venture capital getting involved. And so uh, as the regulation kicks in, they admitted, you know, we're going to have to do this in this way. They also, the gates kind of closed to some of those early um, fanboy and fangirl uh, boosters. Of, of, and so a lot of people that would have liked to invest in Filecoin could not. And then, and then from there, the transition has kind of continued to pace. I, I would, I would and, find, oh yeah. And for those of you who are not uh, intimately familiar with the uh, kind of the SEC regulations, uh, in the US uh, securities, um, and it's an interesting whole interesting question of like what exactly is a security which we can go into separately but securities have to be registered with the SEC um, and once they're registered they need to have certain uh, things that they follow you have to do a prospectus you have to do an uh, offering and and you know uh, and, and disclose stuff and it, it, it's complicated it's not uh, it's it's far from trivial um, there are a few exemptions and one of the ones that pretty much every startup out there has used uh, at one point or the other is that you can issue securities to uh, rich people and the, the the definition of rich people is what's called an accredited investor <coughs> an accredited investor uh, the cut the threshold i believe is two hundred fifty thousand in annual income or a million dollars in assets excluding your primary residence uh, people who qualify uh, can actually just you know, you can meet them at a, at a uh, at a cafe and takes uh, take their money and issue them uh, a certificate, a share certificate, or a or you know more commonly some type of uh, security. Like there's a few common ones. So there is uh, what's called a convertible note, uh, which the National Venture Capital Association has kind of a standard set of terms for a convertible note. And then there is uh, what's called the SAFE, the Simple Agreement for Future Equity, which was pioneered by an accelerator in San Francisco called Y Combinator, uh, which is one of the more famous ones. So the so those, a lot of startups have been funded as SAFEs, uh, including Scylla, by the way. Um, but before that, a lot of uh, startups were funded as convertible notes. Uh, my, Last startup simple, um, so that is that is very common and it's 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 kind of well understood. But you do have to do that only with accredited investors, um, and that was not something that at least the early ICOs did because they didn't feel that they or, or the they didn't think that they were needed to comply with the securities law, so they didn't have to uh, they didn't need to get an exemption. Um, but what Marcus is saying is that Filecoin was one of the first to actually say, hey we do feel like we are subject to those laws which means that we should come under some sort of an exemption and by setting up this uh, this saft analogous to the safe uh, we should be under the same exemption but that does mean that we can only take money from accredited investors that's right and, and thus the, the maturity of, of the field was was beginning to set in 
Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that, that of course does, it increases uh, safety, which is which, from a certain perspective, which is the goal of the regulators. Uh, also, it, it triggered the end of a certain kind of wild, a romantic wild west feeling of the space, which again was that you could kind of uh, sit at home and try to get your way in uh, uh, without much um, uh, diligence being done on that investment and then the holding an asset privately with a, with a private key. And as of today, they're increasingly you're talking to a wealth advisor or a broker or some hedge fund guy trying to put you into a deal. Oh, I did not realize that. Has it come to that now? Uh, it's, it's, you'd be surprised. Um, I, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard to have data on this because it's, it's private investment. So investors are not necessarily disclosed, but there's, as someone that's kind of been on the fundraising side of this a bit professionally, yeah, there's a lot of that going on. Um, Interesting. So yeah. it's, it's, so a system that was designed to, uh, originally designed to sort of get uh, almost like a crowdfunding uh, aspect into it of like people who are going to actually use the end product, putting in their money, and then eventually using that to use the product at some point in the future, yes. has now transformed into sort of more investment bankers, That's guys correct. in suits selling, uh, selling a security or something that looks very much like a security to rich people. Uh, you're exactly correct, Shamir. And and so here here's here's something I always like to point out. Um, Chrome was originally founded with this excitement around crowdfunding laws. Uh, so we we had, of course, I don't know if, if, if the audience is aware of this. We have something in the U.S. called a Regulation CF. It's essentially the thing that allows for a very constrained kind of you know populist investing, which is to say you can raise up to a million bucks this way. There are a lot of controls around the you know when when it's part of the Jobs Act. Not this rings a bell for anyone. There, there was a lot of excitement around this stuff. It took years for it all to happen. You know, the laws were, were put into place like in 2012. And then, you know, the, the SEC took a huge amount of time figuring out, oh gosh, how are we going to let, the, you know, how are we going to let all of America participate in the private investment? It's gonna, we're going to destroy the economy if we don't do it correctly. So, so then here's the thing. They, they, put, they put so many strictures in place that it, there was kind of a, a gating effect, which is that if you were a company that needed to do it in this way, if you had to check all these boxes, there weren't that many exciting companies willing to do it. And so for all the excitement around crowd investing, the regulated approach to crowd investing was kind of a flop. Mm -hmm. So then here's the thing, not long after that was sort of flailing, this completely wild west approach in ICOs showed that there was actually from an investor perspective, it wasn't as if the demand wasn't there in the populace. Uh, the, the, you, could, you could chart you know, the amount raised through the, through the regulated you know, SEC approved approach and it's a fraction of what the Wild West economy had all these, you know, home desk jockeys doing. So it, for, for a moment there, we had a really interesting experiment um, in, in the U.S. Like in 2016, I think, was probably like when the, the Reg CF was there. And you could go out and raise That's money right. under it, or you could do an ICO. Everybody did an ICO. Absolutely, yeah. And, and of course, all the investors were excited by the ICO stuff as well. So I would say that in short there, what we, what we showed is that, now I'm not, I'm not saying that this, says, that this proves that less regulation would necessarily be good. But if one wanted to argue that, that the Jobs Act stuff was a failure because it, investors don't, like retail investors, non-accredited investors don't care about private investments, technology investments, they were wrong. Uh, nice. They just needed to be shown either the mechanism or the kinds of deals, the kinds of projects that would be exciting to them. So um, now, of course, unfortunately, that little window um, kind of closed again. So we, we, we only need to kind of remember that there is a theoretical uh, pool of capital there, um, e even though it's kind of hard to access once again. Uh, yes, and that you know that sounds like a that's disappointing to me in some ways that uh, that that original promise of the you know the democratizing finance or whatever you want to call it uh, seems to have been lost a little. Is there any way to issue tokens, ex securities, whatever, raise money uh, more than a million dollars? from retail investors uh, legally in the US. Let's put it like that. Then. There is. Um, it's called Regulation A+. Plus. It's another part of the JOBS Act. Now, it's it's been, uh, wouldn't quite call it a failure, but it's been, it's been a, again, a fraction of capital raised using that method, and here's why. Um, the SEC will allow you to raise up to $50 million from the general public, but you have to really, it's like a little mini IPO. So you've got to really disclose everything to them. And, and really, what the, the way to consider it from an economic perspective, the cost of capital to raise $50 million from the crowd is very high. Mm -hmm. So un unlike the turnkey process that we kind of mentioned, a very quick and, and painless 
uh, right to the market. The, the SEC, you know, as you increase the sum, um, you increase you increase the cost that you pay your lawyers to deal with the SEC. So there's just there's just no um, clean and easy path towards the retail market. You've got to it, it's going to cost you either you can't raise much or it's going to cost you a lot to raise more. So XCF is relatively easy to do, but it only gives you a million. That's right. It doesn't really go far. Um, Reg A plus gives you up to fifty million, but it is a lot of work. That's right. Or yeah. you go to the SAFD. That's right, and, and thus you, 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 you really are marketing that investment to a different community at this yes. point. Yep, you're marketing yeah. it to people who are relatively well off to begin with, right? That's correct. Right. Um, yeah. Interesting. So, in in the middle of all of this, the there has been a massive startup boom. Um, if you look at like the the startup economy um, in the U.S., but now definitely globally, there was you know the dot com boom in the late '90s, which was really an IPO boom. Back then, uh, companies like Amazon, for example, or PayPal were founded and then went public within 18 months of being founded, or 24 months, right? Uh, so, and and a lot of companies went public. A lot of companies went bust during the IPO. That's right. The dot com bust from sort of 2000. Uh, you know, the famous names, Webvan, Pets.com, and all these stories, right? Um, and then the the startup world didn't end. Right? So people mm -hmm. still started up companies like Google, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or Facebook uh, in that kind of, you know, 99 to 2006 period. That's right. And then there was another little uh, burst of like growth uh, with like Google going public in 04. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, you know, eBay acquired PayPal, Google itself acquired YouTube. I think of Flickr as Flickr. being a triggering moment of it. Flickr, Flickr was... Um, yeah, it was a, it launched in the win, the startup winter, yeah, and, yeah. and 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 um, you know, it's actually founded by the by the same CEO, the CEO of Slack, who was yeah. who was recently um, benefited by his his sort of storied place in this ecosystem. Flickr sold to Yahoo for forty million, if I remember correctly, wow. in like in like um, two thousand five, maybe two thousand six. Yeah. And it, it, I remember it kind of sent this sort of that or that, that feeling of of like you know greed kicking back. In. Yeah. Because it seemed, and this is funny now, given the sum, but it seemed like a big sum. It thought, man, they just kind of whipped together a little photo sharing app and built a network, and by God, they've developed all this value in a short period of time. Of course, that sum was, um, you know, quickly seems, dwarfed. Um, yeah, and, and it's, it seems uh, almost laughably small. <laughs> I, I think of it as the spark that kicked off the um, the Web 2.0. If you remember, Yahoo was kind of oh, yeah, Yahoo behind was a, a series of acquisitions company. there. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, and seemed to have for a long time. It seemed like that whole uh, thing was like acquiring promising startups and killing them. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's basically yeah. That's what they were really good at. Intrinsically good at. Yeah. <laughs> but then, just as that was beginning to take off in like 06 or mm -hmm. you had the financial crisis of that's 08, right. and yeah. that uh, basically killed the IPO uh, market again. That's right. Yeah. And no, nobody was doing IPOs between 08 and and 10. Um, and then from sort of 2010 to now, there's been growth in the startup world, in the private markets. Uh, and there have been a few uh, IPOs, obviously Facebook, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, of course the companies like uh, Alibaba and have done some massive IPOs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but what has happened is that if you look at kind of like the um, the Amazon uh, IPO was like, like I think it was less than 100 million. Yes. Um, yeah. And you saw Google, which was a huge IPO at something like a 4 billion market cap in 2004. Yeah. Um, then, um, Facebook in 2012 was like 40 billion right. and was massive, right? Um, and so companies are going public much, much later that's than right. they used to. And that's Absolutely. that's completely kind of uh, non-controversial. Everybody agrees to that. And what's really happened is that a lot of money and investment that used to happen in the first five years after IPO, mm -hmm. uh, public market buyers, have moved into the private market, right. and now you have you know SoftBank's banks fund with of like a hundred billion, um, which is which is fine, right? Like I mean, the people can go public. It's it's up to you know entrepreneurs who are starting their companies and and, the, and their teams. Uh, but you you could as a retail investor go to Nasdaq or NYSE and buy uh, Amazon stock or or Apple stock in ninety nine. That's right. Uh, or Google stock in 05. That's right. Uh, or Facebook stock in 2012. All of those would have been great, great investments if you held them long enough. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, now, it, it's not really possible to do that in 
whichever startup of this generation that you want, right? Uber, Airbnb, uh, yeah. and all of those guys, by the time they go public, will probably be 20 billion plus in valuation, right. maybe 100 billion plus in right. some cases. Um, so also all that growth, uh, is has moved from the public markets into the private markets. Exactly. Exactly. And so, as a retail investor, uh, your public market options have gotten less and less exciting. I would say. Yes. Uh, yeah. Especially if you're a, uh, if you want to do tech investing. That's right. And unless you're rich, uh, your your private options never really existed. That's right. And doesn't feel like they still exist either. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right, Shamir. It's it's um it's funny that we're we're playing this role because in theory I'm the picks and shovels ICO guy um, and so but I'm gonna make the sort of counter obvious point here inside of this dialogue it's 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 the fate of so much of sort of future of capitalism is, is on the is on the line here now this all of these things are true uh, regulation essentially has the effect of, of restricting growth of capital to those that are already in possession of capital and and so taking that alone you think screw that you know open the floodgates, wild west, uh, my own knowledge of technology in the market should, should permit me to participate. However, now the ICO market was also a good uh, demonstration of what happens when in a completely that. wild west situation. I, I, have, I would say that um, in, invest, investing in ICOs is kind of like truffle hunting in, in the trenches of World War I, <laughs> in that the, it's, it is, it's, it's almost literally dangerous. The, 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 before the oversight, and really after the oversight, the, the, the ratio of pure scams, I mean, not, e not, even, not even kind of well-intentioned well you know, screw-ups, but just pure, like, multi-level marketing scams, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 to 1 for, for honest projects. Wow. Now, so which, which is, you really saw the worst of humanity uh, in a lot of the ICO boom. Um, a lot of money was grifted. A lot of the, a lot of the later money that came in, you know, they didn't really know anything about blockchain technology. They just heard that, you know, they heard at like at the grocery store, their bag Big boy money. said, Hey, what coins are you in right now? Um, so, so basically there's the trade off because on, on one hand, the re the regulation incre increases inequality. On the other hand, in the absence of any regulation whatsoever, um, the you know the the retailers, the retail markets are fleeced, mm -hmm. and so um, we. I think the the ICO, the ICO market has kind of helped. I think it's been very educational. Say that we have not really found a good equilibrium, and we're not sitting in a good place of equilibrium right now. And I think what's interesting, we have an SEC right now that that's open to hearing this, mm -hmm. and and I think it's interesting if we can look at our recent history make some informed calculations about how regulation can help this issue on both sides. Um, we might have some dialogue with, with, our, with our regulators locally, and I think this is happening uh, on a global level right now. And so this cryptocurrency movement has, may help actually push the structure of regulation a bit um, by, by having performed this wild experiment um, on, the, on the operating table. And it's, it's interesting, you, you say it's, it's like a wild west. Yeah. Um, because it, in fact, that's exactly how the Wild West was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we are living, uh, you and I are sitting at least in what used to be the Wild West, uh, not a hundred years, 120 years ago. Right. Uh, Portland was uh, as far, what as far west as you could get in the US before you got to the ocean. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the history of the Wild West, you think it's all about cowboys shooting each other. That is much less of that than you might think. Uh, but there was definitely every almost like clockwork every seven to ten years there was a boom and bust cycle in the economy of the u.s between uh the civil war and world war uh world war one yeah. 1865 to 1917 really um and as with each of those boom and bust cycles you would see waves of uh business figures that's right uh, but waves of bank figures because right. banks were the that the, the, there wasn't Really, like the, the stock markets were a tiny little New York, Chicago sort of thing back then, um, and there would be stock market failures and booms and busts as well. But what really, like uh, the 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 average cowboy lost his money on the local bank failure, not because some company uh, uh, in in New York uh, went bust or right. went public, right? Yeah. Um, and in okay. fact, that cycle of boom and bust led to initially the creation of the Federal Reserve. Um, and then uh, there was another period of where there wasn't a bust for a while until we had the biggest one of them all, the, you know, the crisis of 1929, which then led to the creation of the SEC and the 
FDIC right. and all the modern uh, securities regulation. Right. Uh, first, the banks got regulated, then the bus moved into the public markets, then the, the public markets got regulated, uh, and now the boom and bust seems to have moved into the crypto markets. Yes. What do you see coming down the pike in terms of crypto regulation? So this, this is a great question. Now, I, I've, been, I've been one to say, you know, uh, again, I, as I said in my intro, Chrome has always taken a regulation-centric view upon the market. It's constrained our growth in a way because we missed out on a lot of the Wild West stuff. We just thought, that can't last. There's no way I can, I can't, uh, I'm I'm a C, uh, we, we're a C corporation, right? So I can't, I just, but so. so Marcus, on the bright side? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you have much less on your conscience. Yes, it's true. And you're not in jail either. Like, this is really good. I, I count my blessings. Every morning I wake up and I'm not in jail, I feel great. Let's <laughs> start my day. Me too, by the way. Yeah, so I, I think coming ahead, so what, what I was going to say is that I've always said, you know, hey, what regulations are we going to see to, to govern this market? And I've always said, well, the, the Securities Act and the Exchange Act already do this. So in, in other words, the first step of regulation is just figuring out how the current regulations apply. Uh, I think people have been too—they've um, been too excited to think that we've got new new laws coming down the pike. Now, now that said, so the first thing I want to say again is case law that will help apply the current regulations. Um, you know, what, one thing I'll point out here is that um, we—it's been a very interesting time to watch the SEC. Uh, last year, uh, one of the commissioners, uh, last name Hinman. Uh, made now it wasn't a, people have gotten this a bit wrong it, it wasn't actually regular new regulation or even new case law new interpretation it was just a public speech but we are we are looking for these kinds of tea leaves to see what what is the SEC thinking what do they see in the near future it's a guessing game Hinman um, they, they have these remarks published uh, on the web so I, I, I if you if you re, if you google Hinman SEC crypto you'll you'll, you'll see this and it's a very nuanced speech. It shows that these regulators, a lot of times we get sort of from the issuer's perspective, we get mad about these, these dullard, you know, bureaucrats. They're, they're, um, the, the enforcement actions, the, the public speeches that they're making, they're very, very uh, surprisingly sophisticated about the tech and the law. Um, and, and what Hinman said was it kind of it shocked people. His personal feeling of interpretation was that given the, given the regulations as they stand, he said, I guess to, to compress it, he said, the Ethereum ICO was probably a security. Of course, we didn't know what to call it. It happened. We're not going to go enforce it now. However, what he said was that today, Ethereum as it stands today, Ether is not a security. So what this means is that this is really mind-bending, but, but through Hinman's view, it's possible that when something is young and, and the risk is high, and the, the network has not launched. If you want to raise money then, you've got to talk to us because you're talking about an investment. But once, a, unlike, unlike a corporate stock, um, it's not the case to say that when Coca-Cola was young, it was a security, but today it's not. No, it's still a security. What he's saying is that there are some fundamental natures of a decentralized network. What he says is that when you look at Ethereum, it's not so clear that the Ethereum Foundation is the beneficiary of all the, the growth and value of Ethereum. It's a cluster of computers running in, and synchronized throughout the world, and the value creation is distributed as well. So it is, it is that thing that the, that the crypto enthusiasts have always thought, say, this isn't really a company, man, it's a coin, and that's something completely new. And this is Hinman saying, actually, you're right. Once you hit this de decentralization, decentralization, this inflection point, yeah, you, you can go ahead and trade Ether, and it does still seem to have some properties in that you can buy and sell, and you've got a price chart, you can do intraday trading, you can also use Ethereum to execute software. Yes, and we do. do. And so, and so, it may it may be that we if if if, if now Henman is just one piece of the SEC, but it, but if the Henman interpretation becomes more established, we may get some sounder footing under which we can have sort of a crypto economy where you don't have to be an accredited investor in order to buy and sell coins and use coins once they've reached a certain point of adoption. Of course, the point here being, how do you launch the network? If it's a security to begin with, one and if one one counter effect to this is that the coins that launched and got their decentralization accomplished before the SEC came to stop them, the SEC might have an effect to say, well, older coins have a, an advantage, and that's that's true as well. Uh, in a sense, the SEC may be essentially defending the layer one incumbents of Bitcoin and Ethereum. 
Um, that is interesting. It's interesting. Yeah, it is because then it's like, hey, if you manage to do, if you manage to get through the phase where you wear a security yes. before the SEC was uh, actively sort of enforcing securities laws the, right. uh, in the crypto space, then you got, you know, you managed to kind of sneak in uh, or you were grandfathered in yes. because they're not going to go back now and. It doesn't look like they're going to go back now and arrest Vitalik and, and charge him with SEC violations. I don't so, think so, yeah. I hope not. I do like him. He's, uh, he's quite funny. He's an interesting guy, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, the, but if you're doing that today and you're trying to launch whatever, Ethereum 2.0, and, uh, and, and you go out and you follow that process, there will be a period of time where at least some where your token is going to be a, a security that's and right so you do have to follow a process of uh, uh, and there are a few different ways whether it's a cf reggae plus or the saft or or maybe an sto but you sure. do have to kind of uh, uh follow the securities laws if you're issuing in the uh us so tell us about stos sure yeah well uh, technically so it's, uh, sto stands for security token offering and it's it's kind of an umbrella term and, and really i would say that each, if, if you were to, uh, a SAFT or, or to, which, so a SAFT generally uses Regulation D, which is the common st startup financing uh, exemption. Uh, you, you could use Regulation A plus actually and wedge it into a SAFT as well. It's a bit complicated, but basically this, the STO movement is a way of saying, okay, here are the kinds of coins that are using securities laws properly. And so this, this movement that we see, post Filecoin movement, uh, and, and again, a lot of the larger ICOs today should be classified as, as, as an STO. If they've gotten approval from some uh, regulatory body for the offering, that's an STO. Right. And, and another thing to note is that you could use a security token. Um, this, is, this is really complex stuff here. So you could use a security token structure to do a very traditional kind of offering. In other words, it, not even necessarily a crypto network. You could do an STO financing of a traditional uh, SaaS startup. But if you use the technology, which is to say, cool, investors will hold a token and that will be you know, representative, uh, that digital asset will represent their, their equity stake, then, then that's part of the SEO umbrella as well. Exactly, and so to, if you kind of think about it, uh, a startup might choose to go out and say, hey, we're going to raise money and we're going to raise it in the traditional way of doing a convertible note or a safe. That's right. And we're going to go to "Quote unquote rich people or accredited investors, and and raise money from them. And you know, there's angels, there's VCs, there's seed funds. It's, it's but instead of giving them the uh, PDF documents saying that hey, so and so has signed, you're going to give them a token instead. That's right. which is equivalent. Um, and there's no reason why that can't be leg legally equivalent. And that would technically be an STO as well. That's right. When when you're doing something that's a very traditional process, but just adding a new layer of technology, which might be better as well. Um, Typically, though, I think the many of those processes, especially the, I think Reg A plus, but also the Reg D, come with limitations on trading. Uh, that are the, that are that might be more problematic if it's uh, if those are issued in a tokenized form. That is true. However, uh, Reg A plus does does allow for unrestricted uh, resale. Okay. Uh, it's the only of that of that tier. That's the only one that really fits all those properties. But you're right, Reg D. Uh, generally, those those restrictions are a year plus lockup. Yeah, uh, which which doesn't doesn't work well if you want to immediately see immediate liquidity. Yeah, but if Filecoin owners, for instance, there is no liquid market for Filecoin. Uh, the SAFT uh, placements, you're just sitting. Those investors are just sitting on them for now. The SAFT placement. Yeah, got it. So, um, can you? Speak about the current. I'm looking at some of the questions here. Yeah, um, I, I think we kind of uh, addressed Jimmy Dorsey's uh, question here on about a coin representing a haircut. Uh, why, if, and anyone can buy a haircut. Why would be? Why would the haircut coin be a security? The haircut coin might not necessarily be a security. It would very much depend on the process and the way that it was issued and what it represented from a legal purpose. Right? I, I agree. Uh, you know, the the interesting question there is is if, if you've got a one-to-one -one purchase of, of a good uh, you, you you could make a strong argument you have Kickstarter pre-sale model there and and thus if, if you know here, here's the here's the distinction I think if the barbershop exists and and those are, are priced already and there's an established price for that and you can buy um, it on the blockchain and walk Next tomorrow into the barbershop. Sounds and get like a gift. Sounds like a gift card to me, and I don't believe that is a security. 
however, if the barbershop doesn't yet exist, then uh, if you're hoping to finance the construction of the barbershop with the sale uh, of the uh, haircut coin, then that, that starts to look more like a security. Okay, yeah. okay. good to understand. Uh, and about the current ICO landscape outside of the US, that might be interesting. What's happening outside of the US? We've been very <laughs> focused on SEC and US laws here. That's but of true. course, that's outside the US, it's a very different uh, wild, wild east maybe. That's true. I, I, I'll say that uh, I'm a pretty domestic guy um, in, in that, in, given, given basically, basically for, just from my own perspective, in my mind to fully grasp um, a, a, an offering it, because I wanted to say, well, I need to really understand the regulatory landscape. There's a huge barrier to, go in, to going and really understanding, you know, um, the, the UK paradigm and, 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 and beyond. Um, so, but, I, but anecdotally, I do, I do know a few things. One, one thing to note is that um, uh, there's a big movement within, within um, both ICO issuers and also operators to, to domicile them themselves in places that are specifically more amenable to these kinds of things. So a couple of, of territories have been of interest. Um, of course, uh, Zug in, in Switzerland, which has also been a, a, a haven for a lot of inter interesting sort of banking operations as well uh, for traditional reasons. Uh, the Cayman Islands, you'll see this a lot. Now, I, I'll, I'll say this, as I throw out these kind of jurisdictions, that, hey, you can more freely get stuff done on these islands. It, it's one-to-one -one, uh, in relationship to the kinds of things where you'd have to see shady offshoring and various, you know, so it, it, a lot of those offerings, some of them are really sound and legit. Uh, one thing, for instance, the, uh, a, a crypto network I like a lot, Augur, uh, a new part of the Augur network called Vale launched just a few weeks ago. They're, they're headquartered in the Caymans. I don't necessarily think of that as a stroke against them, but because it's involving gambling regulations, well, it's a prediction market. Um, you know, it's just interesting to note they, the, the domicile of the operators and the regulatory environment there has influenced a lot of the, the sort of global activity. And, and then another thing I'll note is that it's not just a question of purely regulated states versus mostly unregulated uh, area. There's just, there, there are a lot of very legitimate um, groups that are just coming out of Europe. I mean, I love, I love for instance, Materium, which is based out of London, uh, Sine Gupta, um, and, and they're just dealing with different, um, you know, I can't speak as articulately about the exact nature of the way that they're getting those exemptions or, or registrations done. I, I think in a lot of the more, basically, here's, here's the thing, where you have capital, you have regulation. Yeah. And um, it, it, increasingly to invest in ICOs today, if you want to find an overseas uh, offering, if they're in a regulated market, uh, expect some extra hoops there yeah. as well. On the flip side, if they're based in the Cayman Islands or Zoog or... or or Bermuda or wherever, That's right. uh, that might be less regulated than the U.S. On the flip side, that could also be a problem because that yeah. might, there, there might be more scammers there. I, right? I, think, I think you could say that for sure. Um, I, don't think, I don't mean to say that it suggests that it's a scam, but the ratio of, of scams of those groups that are trying to play that kind of artful dance, there's going to be a higher propensity of, of scam projects taking that approach. Yeah, and so then you, you know, it, it goes back to being a buyer beware. Right. Like that's right. If you buy a stock on uh, on Nasdaq or NYSE, you know that there's a reasonable likelihood that it's a legitimate company. There are still the Enron and WorldCom and other sorts of scams that very large companies have run. Yet they are one in thousands. Right. That's right. Uh, the yeah. companies fail, but they fail for traditional reasons, like their business didn't work out. That's right. Um, but in the you know the, the less regulated the market, the higher likelihood of uh, of there being a scam. Um, but that's then up to you as a buyer to, or an investor to, to do your due diligence. That's um, right. Completely. So uh, any other questions here from the uh, audience? Um, if you guys have more questions, feel free to, uh, to fire, uh, fire them at us. Uh, I have a couple of topics here I'm looking at. I want to make sure I hit. And one thing is token economics versus tokens merely as a fundraising mechanism. Uh, now, yeah. we set this up as a talk about ICOs and people have been using ICOs like kind of like IPOs, right? Like a way of raising money. But reality is that that's not what, that's not what the original vision of like the Bitcoin token was for sure. Right. And uh, arguable, I don't think it was the vision of the Ether token. It's not much of the usage of Ether either. Um, and that's not necessarily what tokens can be used for. It's purely for fundraising. There's lots of other things. So talk to us about, about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, I, I think that, the uh, Ethereum, when it when it launched, it was trying to describe itself in one one pithy line. I said, oh, it's, a, it's a global computer." Mm -hmm. um, 
turns out it's not really yet become that. You don't want to use Ethereum to uh, calculate pi. Um, Oh, that's an interesting thought. Uh, you actually could, but it would be in. It'd be in very expensive. It's not really efficient for that purpose. Oh, oh God. So oh. It, it turns out that Ethereum's first use case was actually ICOs. Yeah. The, the, the primary thing that it was being used. So it, they, they didn't. They didn't really. It wouldn't really have had the same ring to it if they said, "Hey, Ethereum. It's it's the coin for making other coins with." <laughs> um, so so, but but it just turns out to be that that was an early use case that sort of, you know some tremendous amount of transaction velocity was, was formed around that case. So for the raising of the coin. Now, of course, if that's all it's good for, then we have a recursive problem in that you can't, like, there's no reason to invest if the coin, if the, if the functionality can't perform some other business value. Yep. So, so um, basically here, all of this energy discussion, oh, all these millions of dollars being poured into these projects, it, it's, it's great to turn around and say, what, for, for what purpose? What are we doing? What, what's the business value that we're trying to hit beyond that? And I, I think one of the, we, we have some pure innovation that at, at least at least written about uh, extensively in white papers and uh, within within the space. Uh, you know, we talked about all the interesting trade offs in society around safety and 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 you know equity. Uh, the, another thing is is this, uh, a lot of a lot of um, experimentation around economics and, and specifically token economics. So. Um, a majority of quality projects, in order to make their pitch to the public, they have to say, why does this coin, why is the price going to go up? What? Because I understand what equity is, right? I understand that equity is sort of a, a projection of future cash in a in very simplified sense. It's it's the, you know, it's it's a, it's a something you can look at a balance sheet of a company and connect the value to equity. You can perform yeah. a fun, fundamental analysis in that way. Well, so we have, no, we have no company here. We have no balance sheet to speak of. So what... Where does a coin derive its value from? So in order to, to, to find the answer there, you have to look at the economics of the token. And gosh, this is an interesting topic, but uh, you know, um, really concisely stated, we've been talking about Ethereum. The, the token economics of Ethereum were like this. In, in order to do any of these things, that were, you know, for instance, the prediction market or an advertising network, that project, uh, you know, Ethereum itself, you, you, these projects that run on Ethereum in order to execute that software, you have to spend gas. You have to spend ether in order to make it run. So you're essentially paying for the computing power. That's the premise of Ethereum. So outside of the speculation about what, what other hedge funds think Ethereum will do in the future, the fundamental value of ether is like, hey, it's fun. You can run these little software scripts using this resource. So in theory, the more people running these scripts, that's the fundamental demand for the coin. And that's why, in theory, if the if the demand for that coin out you know outstrips the supply of it, given given and there's the other part of the equation, these coins all have this sort of different sense of an algorithmic kind of supply. There, there you have a way of describing fundamental value. And and I have to say, I mean, it's just um, it's such a crazy playground for economists to sort of sit and think about. You know, inherent in every project is some different twist or experiment here, and um, none of it's been very well validated. Yet. I'll admit that certainly, but yeah, um, that uh, that part of it is um, a super early stage. I mean, we are we're looking at this as ourselves at Scylla right now because uh, we're launching our uh, smart contract on the mainnet probably in uh, end of this month, early next month. Great, and then um, you know we'll have to start paying uh, an ether as well and trying to understand how to manage that. Uh, right. It is it is interesting, um, and I'm sure we can chat much more about that. Uh, but I do believe we are out of time now. Um, um is uh I, I see that we do have a few more questions uh unfortunately <coughs> jimmy and alvaro uh i don't think we'll be able to get to that uh today uh, i'll tell you what uh, jimmy i'll hang out and type an answer to you if we still have the chat window open it's a it's a, i'm interested in that, that and, as well. and by the way uh you can find both marcus and me on twitter i'm sure there's other uh, uh Telegram, whatever the other platforms as well. Uh, but feel free to you know follow Silla on Twitter or me or Marcus and ask us questions. And yeah, uh, this is a, this is a fascinating topic. And of course, one hour isn't nearly enough to get into to really all the detail of it. Thank you so much, uh, uh, guys. Uh, it was a pleasure having you. And you know, thank you for being engaged and asking questions and everything. Thank you. It's a pleasure.